Good morning. Wow, that is, will that wake you up or what? Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, Fred's up. All right, Fred. <coughs> So you have no, don't forget next Sunday is our special video that we're going to be showing. So I look forward to seeing you here for that. And uh, Christmas, I hope everyone will have a very blessed Christmas this week. Is it Friday? Yes. Friday, okay. said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Let's stand as we say the
what's that wonderful presentation this morning? Yeah. I kind of still get a little emotional about it. <laughs> but I had a wonderful time. <laughs> See the blessed infant. 
so as we begin our message. Heavenly <clears throat> Father, we just want to come to you right now just as we have chills just thinking about your son coming and you throwing off all of the trappings of the majesty that are there and come before us and to redeem us from our sin, Father. As we look at the word this morning, as we look in Psalms 119, we, you open our eyes, would you open our ears and let us see and hear what you have for us. So, Father, we so thank you for everything. Just let us worship you right now in the word and gain an understanding and reach out and seek closer to you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Does anyone know what the word zeal means? Talk about a zeal. Passion? Be on fire? Yeah, zeal? Zealot came from that. The word zealous came from that? Zealot. Zealot? Okay. Um, here's how the dictionary described, defines the word zeal. A strong interest or devotion. <clears throat> Intense enthusiasm. A fervor or great warmth of emotion. Today, as we, as we look at the 18th paragraph, can you believe that? 18 weeks we've been in one little chapter of the Bible. As we look at the 18th paragraph of Psalm 119, we're going to be considering the psalmist's zeal for God's Word. And he begins this paragraph, uh, verses 137 through 144, he begins this paragraph talking about the, the perfect righteousness of the Lord and the perfect righteousness of His Word. He, he's, he's zealous for, uh, for the Word of God. Uh, despite his stubborn enemies, despite rejection, despite troubles in his life, he is zealous for God's word. And despite all that, we're going to see that he's an overcomer. And uh, as we all can be uh, in our lives, in spite of all the chaos that's going on in the world, the problems in our world today, we too can be overcomers. Let's take a look at what we can learn by observing the psalmist's zeal for God's word in, in face of stubbornness, in face of rejection, and in face of troubles. Let's, first of all, we want to begin uh, in verses uh, 137 uh, through 139, we're going to look right now at the zeal for God's word in the face of stubbornness. In the face of stubbornness, the zeal for God's word. The psalmist, with, with zeal and with, with faithfulness to the Lord, uh, he attempted to share God's word. And he attempted to share God's ways with the people around him and his culture. To him, it may appear that he failed. Oftentimes, uh, when we share the word of God with, with folks and they just totally reject us or, or, or <clears throat> don't want to have anything to do with it, won't listen to what we have to say, sometimes uh, we, we may feel like I failed. I didn't do something right. But listen, in spite of, of that, uh, it may appear that, that he failed, but he didn't. He didn't. He remained faithful, as we should also. Remember what I said once before about what a successful evangelism is? To be successful in, in, in uh, as we read the scripture this morning, take the, 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 the gospel message to the whole world, preach the Preach the gospel to the whole world. And as we do that, successful evangelism is simply this. Presenting the kingdom gospel 
in the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. See, a lot of times we want to be responsible for the results, but we're not. See, Jesus has already done his part. He was born of a virgin birth. He lived uh, uh, as a human amongst us. He went to the cross. He died on the cross for the, for the sins of mankind to be our Savior. And, and he did his part. And the Holy Spirit will do his part by convicting that individual and drawing them to God. And God will do his part, as he says he will, that when a person gives their life to Christ, when they place their faith and trust in Christ, God will adopt them into his family. He'll forgive them of their sins. He'll cause them to become a new creation in Christ, and he'll adopt them into his family. Okay, that's the part of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? You got the Trinity in there doing that. Our part is simply to present the kingdom gospel. That's all. We're not there to do the convicting. We're not there to do the saving. We're simply there to present the gospel message. And that's what the psalmist had done in, uh, to his culture. He had probably tried to show them God's word, tried to show them God's ways. But even in the midst of, of the rejection and the stubbornness on the part of the people, he may have failed uh, he, he may have felt that he failed in that area, but he didn't. He remained faithful, though, just like the Lord and his word is faithful. The Lord is righteous. That means he's morally right. God's word is righteous. It's morally right. People may reject or even criticize the Word of God. But I'll tell you something, that's not going to change a thing. I don't care how much you come against God's Word. I don't care how much you criticize the Word of God or how much you criticize God. It's not going to change anything because God's Word is eternal and it cannot be broken. It cannot be broken. In fact, Jesus said in, in John 10, 35, that uh, God's word cannot be broken. Also, God's word remains forever. It's everlasting. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 89, he says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. It's a done deal. David wrote in Psalm 33, verse 11, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations, all generations, past, present, and future generations. God's, the plans of the heart of God stands firm, solid, forever. And then we can read in Isaiah, <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. It says the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. You ever seen the grass wither in your yard? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I, I have. You ever seen the flower, the, the, the flower fade? Yeah. Let me tell you something. Watch the grass wither and the, and the flower fade. But God's word is not going to do any of that. It stands forever stands forever. Jesus said it, and it's recorded in three different places, Matthew 24, 35, Mark 13, 31, and Luke 21, 33. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will by no means pass away. God's word is going to be here to the very end. In fact, God's word is going to be here past the very end. To all, to all eternity, God's word stands. So let's look at uh, verses 137 and 138. See what the psalmist uh, says there. In verse 137, 138, he says, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. Your testimonies which you have commanded are righteous and very faithful. <clears throat> Have you heard the word God, God, that God is omnipotent? 
omnipotent. That means he's all powerful. He is all powerful. And, and uh, God uses his almighty power in two ways. God uses his almighty power by the way in which he rules the earth. God rules the earth with justice and with righteousness. With justice and with righteousness. And secondly, by the way he reaches out to man and how he deals with man. God deals with us with love and with faithfulness. With love and, and, and with faithfulness. The Bible says in, in Psalm 89 verse 14, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Listen, God doesn't use his power the way some people use power. God doesn't use his, his, his uh, power the way some arrogant dictator or some bully would, would uh, use it. No. God uses his power with perfect justice and righteousness. God's not cold. He's not disinterested. But neither is he quick to judge. Understand this, though. According to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, eventually, every one of us are going to die and we're going to be judged. I like what <clears throat> Earl Radmacher used to say, who at one time was the president of Multnomah Bible College, <clears throat> as he stood up in his uh, uh, eschatology class and he looked out as he walked in and he looked out amongst all the students and everything and and he says, uh, everyone who has ever been born will exist somewhere forever. And that somewhere is either heaven or hell. And he let that sink in. And then he looked out at his, at, his, at his class and he says, where will you spend eternity forever? The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. But before God eventually judges man, his love and, and faithfulness in his compassion reaches out to us so that we may repent and uh, that we may not perish. We're told in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is going to give us chance after chance after chance, but then there's going to come a time when he says enough is enough. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. In verses 137 and 138 of Psalm 119, <clears throat> the psalmist <clears throat> is saying that, that the Lord is morally right, that his word is morally right in its entirety. The psalmist has learned to trust the Lord and he's learned to trust his word. And I'll tell you something. Deviating from, uh, from God, his ways, deviating from the word of God in the slightest manner. Or, or to compromise God's word by accepting the standards of the world is to dishonor God. And then the psalmist goes on in verse 139 and he says, My zeal has consumed me because my enemies have forgotten your words. In his notes on Psalm 119, Pastor Ivan Reschino from, uh, in India remarked thusly, he says, quote, a, a Bible scholar translated this verse as, my zeal for thy word is so great that when I see 
how my enemies disregard it, I am overpowered by feelings of shame at their neglect. As I was reading this passage of Scripture this past week, and having read what Pastor Ivan had said, <clears throat> this, here's how I translated it. I kind of presented it to the Lord. God, the strong devotion that I have for your word is eating away at me. It's tearing me apart inside because I see how your word is being rejected, disrespected, and trampled upon by ungodly men and women in this world. See that around us today? The word of God is disrespected. It's trampled upon. It is... It is uh, tested, it's tried, it's, it's re, uh, rejected. That should bother each one of us that are genuine believers in Christ. In order to glorify God, our zeal for Him, our, our zeal for His Word must come from true motives. Paul told the church at Galatia, he said, it's good to be zealous if the purpose is good. So what, what must the purpose be? What, how should we exhibit our ze uh, zealousy? Is that the right word? Maybe, maybe I'll make up a new word, zealousy. Our zeal for God's word. Listen, a zeal for the Word of God must contain these biblical ingredients. A zeal for God must be done for the glory of God. Turn in your Bibles over to Numbers, the, 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 the book of Numbers. <clears throat> Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and then Numbers. Numbers chapter 25. Numbers chapter 25. Here we have a, a remember God told the people, get into the promised land, leave, this, leave, leave that area there, get over to promised land, and, and uh, don't intermingle with the foreigners there. Don't have it, don't, intermarry with them or anything. And, and in, in, in chapter 25, verse 1, we see this. Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was roused against them, and he sent a plague to them on them. And so we skip down to verse 7. It says, Now when Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her body. So the plague stopped among the children of Israel. And those who died in the plague were 24,000. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. He says, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel because he was zealous with my zeal among them so that I did not consume the children of Israel with my zeal. Our zeal that we have for the word of God, our zeal that we have for God must be done to the glory of God. 
Secondly, it must be done with proper biblical knowledge. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10 verse 2, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. We've got to have the proper knowledge to have true zeal for God. It's got to contain that. Thirdly, it must be tempered with love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. You know, Paul said he could do all the, he, he could speak in tongues, he could uh, be very eloquent in his speech, he could do all kinds of wonders and miracles and all kinds of things like that. But if he did not have love, he was nothing. It was useless. He could have <clears throat> this great zeal for God, but if it was not tempered with love, it was worth nothing. And then fourthly, it needs to be done for personal holiness. For personal holiness. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> Over to the New Testament now. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look what Paul says about his own life. Chapter 9, verse 27. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. The Apostle Paul says, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul says, I want, a, I want personal holiness in my life. I can't, if there's no personal holiness in my life, how can I preach it to others? How can I teach it to anyone else? I become disqualified. And then we look at Philippians. Look over in Philippians. Just before Colossians. Philippians chapter 3. By the way, some of you remember how to, can, can some of you remember how to remember? <laughs> you got that one? Remember where it's Remember how to remember. Galatians. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I used to have a tough time trying to remember those in that order and thing until Helen taught me. She said, General Electric Power Company. <laughs> listen, listen, you might laugh, but there is power in the Word of God. So think about that. General Electric Power Company. Genesis. Or Genesis. <laughs> Galatians. Yeah, it starts there. Galatians. Ephesians. Philippians. Colossians. Now, we're in Philippians. Chapter 9. Or chapter 3. I'm sorry. Philippians chapter 3, verse uh, 14, 13 and 14. Paul says, Brethren... I do not count myself to apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I'm not going to let my past pull me down. I want this, this personal holiness in my life, and I'm going to push forward for that. We've got to be careful about letting our past pull us down and hold us back from moving forward for the cause of Christ in our zeal for Him and His Word. So there is the psalmist's zeal for God's Word uh, in the face of stubbornness. And then secondly, there's a zeal for God's word in the face of rejection. In the face of rejection. We find in, in uh, verse 140, your word is very pure. Therefore, your servant loves it. The psalmist knows the faithfulness of the Lord. And knowing that, he can, he can say with great confidence 
that God's words, his promises are, are tried and true. Just like pure silver. Just like it's stated in Psalm chapter 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure silver. No, the words of the Lord are pure words, right? <laughs> the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. You know what the seven is? It's perfection. Perfect. Purified seven times. You see, folks, throughout the centuries, God's word has been tested. God's word has been challenged. God's word has been debated. But it has been found to be true and to be a rock of support to everyone going through the trials and the tribulations and the storms of life. Albert Barnes, Albert Barnes was an American theologian in the 19th century. And uh, this, is, <clears throat> this is what he had to say about it, about God's word. He said, if persecution could crush it, it would have been crushed long ago. If ridicule could drive it from the world, it would have been driven away long ago. If argument, as urged by powerful intellect and by learning combined with intense hatred, could destroy it, it would have been destroyed long ago. And if it is not fitted to impart consolation to the afflicted, to wipe away the tears of mourners, and to uphold the soul in death, that would have been demonstrated long ago. He says, in all these methods, it has been tried. And as a result of all, it has been proved as the only certain fact. And because of this, the psalmist can say, he loves the word of God. Now look at verse 141. Verse 141, I am small and despised, yet... I do not forget your precepts. Throughout history, we see how the world has always rejected men and women of God. When we come to saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are sanctified. That word sanctified means to set apart. We're sanctified, we're set apart from the world. God's word separates us from the world. Listen to what the following verses have to say <clears throat> about that. First of all, in James chapter 4, verse 4, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You know what he's saying there? Hey, if you want to adopt the worldview, if you want to, to live by the ways of the world even just a little bit, you are making yourself an enemy of God. God's not making you his enemy. You're making yourself an enemy of God. And I, you know, as I've said before, man, if I'm going to be a friend of God, and if you're an enemy of God, guess what? You're my enemy too. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, he says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and he sums it up, there's only three things that, that, that really count. And these are, by the way, the three things that Satan attacked uh, Adam and Eve in, with in the Garden of Eden. He says, he says, of all the things in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And, and the world is passing away. And, and the lust of it, 
But he who does the will of the Father will abide forever. He abides forever. And then in John chapter 15, verse 19, it says, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. John chapter 17, verses 14 through 16. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world. Here's Jesus is praying to the Father. And he's saying, listen, Father, I've given them your word. And... Uh, the world's hated them because of that, because they're not of this world, just like I'm not of this world. He says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Have you ever been into a, a, a really difficult situation in your life? Uh, maybe it was a relationship problem or a financial problem or some something going on in your life that just seemed kind of pretty heavy on you? What was your prayer to God? God, take me out of this. Was it? God, get this away from me. You know, that's a non-biblical prayer. That's an unbiblical prayer. You know what the disciples did when they were going through the problems in their lives like that? And, and what Jesus just prayed to the Father he says, don't take them out of it. Just keep the evil one away from them. Give them the, the, the power and your enabling grace to get through it. Because sometimes going through that storm in your life, it helps you grow more closer to God. Maybe God wants, there's something in there God wants to teach us. And he does that. You know, that's why the, the, the psalmist said, it is good that I have been afflicted, that I may, I may not sin against you. That's good that I went through this terrible ordeal in my life. Because it's drawn me closer to you. I, I, it, it's caused me to where I can trust in you because I see how great and loving and faithful you are. So don't, don't pray that God will take you out. Pray that God, just give me the, the grace to get through this. You know, there's the enabling grace, and that's exactly what God gave the apostles in Acts when they prayed for, for, for grace. They prayed for, the, for, for grace to be able to continue to present the gospel because they were threatened, they were, had been thrown in jail, and they were threatened to be thrown in jail and, and everything else. But, and then it says, and with great boldness, they preached the word of God. Because of the grace of God that was on them. That's what we need to be praying for. It's God equipping grace. God's enabling grace in our lives. And God's sustaining grace to get us all the way through. Now let's look at what the psalmist, uh, his zeal for God's word in the face of troubles. We've looked at his zeal in the face of stubbornness, his zeal in the face of rejection. What about his zeal in the face of troubles? In verse uh, chapter one, uh, verse one forty-two, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. Do you know every day the world is changing? Every day the world is changing. Technology changes. Customs. Change, <laughs> opinions change. You know, the way we dress changes. I don't wear the same clothes now that I wore in the 60s. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know? You don't know what I wore in the 60s. You said 60s. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't comb my hair the way I did in the 60s. Oh, wait a minute. I had hair back in the 60s. That's right. But you know what? Our expressions change, don't they? 
And even our lifestyles change. But I'll tell you something. There is one thing that never changes. One thing that will never, ever change. And that is God and his word. God and his word never change. Moses, in his prayer that's recorded in Psalm 90 verse 2, says this. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You don't change. God's words, God's ways, God's promises, folks, are always true, and they'll never change. Never God said in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, For I, the Lord, do not change. Boy, how true it is. How true it is. God's righteousness is everlasting. It's everlasting. And then in verse 143, the psalmist writes, Trouble and anguish have overtaken me. Yet your commandments are my delight. Your commandments are my delight. When the psalmist, see what happened was the psalmist here, he's meditating on that verse 142. What does it say in verse 142? Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Your law is truth. And, and, and so he, he, he contemplates that. He spends some time thinking about that. And when he does, when he considers it at length, he is then able to, to withstand the troubles and the anguish and the agony. You know, distress and agony weighs us down. It, it saddens us. Sometimes, sometimes we look ahead and we become fearful of bad situation or, or some occurrence that uh, lies in front of us. I, I see this. I... I talked to several people during the week and everything and this whole pandemic it's got a lot of people in anguish and agony because they're looking ahead and they're fearful about what could happen consider if you will Jesus as he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane look Luke uh, tells us in Luke chapter 22 verse 44 he says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. What, what Jesus experienced here was a very rare condition. It's called, uh, let's see if I can pronounce this right, because I'm not a physician or anything. He's called... Hematiodrosis. Hematiodrosis. In, in which the, the, the human sweat, uh, human beings will sweat blood. And that is caused by some extreme uh, physical or emotional stress. In fact, uh, not only, it, it happened with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. But it, it is, it's been reported uh, in the uh, Indian Journal of Dermatology, volume 59, uh, July of 2019. Uh, it, it's reported that Leonardo da Vinci once described a soldier sweating blood before going into battle. The intense strain the agony, the anguish, the, the, the looking ahead. But I'll tell you something. The person who trusts God, the person who trusts God and submits to him will not be overwhelmed. Isaiah, in fact, says it in Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4. says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in y'all, the Lord is everlasting strength. Isn't that, is, is that not what we're told in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6? 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So the psalmist says that he delights, he loves the word of God. That is, he takes great pleasure in the word of God. And in verse 144, last verse in this paragraph, he kind of sums, uh, kind of ends the paragraph by saying, your righteousness, the righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. Think about that. The righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. They're not going to stop. Give me understanding of your word, God, and I shall live. Here the psalmist acknowledges that the word of God is forever true. God's principles are morally right. And he is morally just. So, so the psalmist here desires to have a, a better understanding of the word of God so that he does not fall into error. Which I'll tell you what, it happens to too many people who don't keep up with the reading and the study of the word of God. In fact, I was sharing with someone this week. Man, if, if, if you don't, Taking in the Word of God is spiritual food for us. It's what gives us our strength and our health. Just like physical food for us does, it gives us our physical strength, our physical health. And I asked this person, I says, tell me something. What would happen to you if you just all of a sudden just quit eating? Just said, I'm not going to eat anything anymore. I'm going on an eternal fast. <laughs> and they said, I'd probably get sick. I'd probably die. I'd get weak. I said, yeah. When you don't take in the word of God, spiritually, you get weak. And you get sick you spiritually die. The word of God is food for our soul. And we can't stop taking in the word of God. In fact, you, some of you that are here, some, uh, a few of you were not here when I gave this challenge. So those of you that haven't taken this challenge before, let me give you the challenge. Let me challenge you all this week Eat physical food the same way you take in spiritual food. Now let's see how healthy you are next week. The psalmist desires a better understanding God, of God's word so, so that he doesn't get weak spiritually. So that he doesn't fall into error. Because it's so easy. If you're not taking in the word of God, it, it's easy for the wrong stuff to come in. The Bible tells us that if that that uh, it, it's the truth that sets us free. It says the truth shall set you free. Jesus said that of God's word. If you know God's word, it'll set you free. But if you don't know the word of God, the false teaching in the world will take you captive and lead you astray. The psalmist wants so much to have a right view of God's word so that he might live the real life. The real life. What is the real life? What is the real life? You know what real life is? Real life is knowing Jesus Christ and becoming a child of God. That's the real life. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. 
He came that we might have full and meaningful, that we might have the real life. See, the life that the world has to offer, it's not real life. Satan will offer you some type of life, but it's not the real life. Sort of like going to a carnival. Anybody ever, you ever going to a carnival and, 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 uh, and, and eating cotton candy? <laughs> cotton candy? You know, cotton candy is nothing but a bunch of fluff. You put it in your mouth and it's gone. You know, it's sweet, tastes good, it's gone. That that the world has to offer you is nothing but cotton candy. It's not good for you. But what the Word of God has to offer you is solid. It's good for you. Real life. Jesus said He came into the world that we might have real life. God's Word, listen, God's Word being absolute truth teaches us that man is sinful. By nature, we're sinful. We're in need of a Savior. One who is perfect. One who is sinless. One who can become a sacrifice for our sins. And so, he came down from heaven. He took on the form of, of man, of humanity, through the virgin birth. He lived as one of us on this earth. And then, he willingly gave himself to be crucified on the cross, to die for the sins of man in order to become our Savior. When we place our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ and repent and ask for forgiveness, we are totally forgiven. And we're totally cleansed. That's what the Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And we receive eternal life. Life forever in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. That, folks, is real life. That's real life. And that is the message that we, as, as true believers, must be proclaiming to the world. We must be proclaiming that to the world. In 1 Corinthians, if you'll turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11... <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 11 I'd like for us to begin in verse 23 here the apostle Paul tells us what Remember I'm saying we need to be proclaiming that message to the world and, and now Paul is, is going to tell us how we can really do that within the body of Christ. How we can proclaim that kingdom gospel. He says beginning in verse 23 For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And then he had given thanks. He broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do... As often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now notice what he says in verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you what? 
you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. One of the ways in which we proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ to the world, amongst ourselves, amongst those who are here, is through observance of the Lord's Supper. So let's come together. Let's come together. As members of God's family, as members of God's family, and honor our Lord in this special season. Honor our Lord through communion. But let me remind you of this warning that the Apostle Paul gives us in his word. And, in verses 27 through verse 29. He says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the blood of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Two things. Number one, we're here as, as a guest of the Lord. It's not my table. <laughs> it's not yours. It's not Brownsboro Community Church's table. Communion is open to anyone that that wants to partake of it if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you're a child of God, then he invites you to come. Because that's what he did with the disciples that night. He invited them to take and eat the bread and, and drink of the cup. But there's another way that you can be Unworthy, Take it in an unworthy manner. If you have unconfessed sin in your life, you haven't got that right with God, then you need to get it right with God first before you come and take of the cup and the, and the bread. So that's why uh, when we have communion uh, service, we, always, we take time just take a few minutes of time to just let you talk to the Lord. Just you and Him. No one else is around. Just, you know, picture yourself as being here all by yourself and with God here. And you talk to Him. And if there is some, if you're harboring some bitterness in your life, some anger, if there's some unconfessed sin that, that you've committed that's in your life that you haven't got right with God, this is the time. Ask Him to forgive you that sin and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And then you come and you take of, of the Lord's Supper of Communion. Father God, how we give thanks to you we thank you for the bread we're about to take as it represents your body that was broken for us we thank you for that and we thank you for the juice we're about to to take, Lord, as it represents the blood that you shed on the cross. For your word says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin, there's no forgiveness of sin, and, and we're thankful for that. So, Lord, we take these elements in deep gratitude and thankfulness to you for your love for us.
God is good. Amen? Amen. Yes. He's a loving God. He's a faithful God. He is a righteous God. And I, I hope that during this Christmas season, that uh, during this time this morning, that you've got a glimpse of the true God and His love, how He came down from... He didn't have to leave His home in glory. He could have stayed there. But He left all of that to come down and live in this sin-sick world, take on humanity, and then to die on the cross for us. Let's be thankful. And let's go out and proclaim the kingdom gospel message. Father God in heaven, thank you again for your word. I thank you for each and every person that's here this morning, Father. And I pray, Father, that your face would shine upon them and that you would bless them in a special way. And that during this, this season, Lord, that they will feel even a closerness to you. They would feel the warmth of your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas to everyone. God bless you. And uh, we'll see you next week. We're going to have that special video. So don't, don't forget to be here. We're going to start right at Maybe 5 till 10, I don't know. But we're going to start on time because it's a long one, okay? God bless you guys.